This is episode 123 of the XY Podcast with Dean Mannix. So in case you're wondering who this mysterious voice is, who suddenly started popping up at the beginning of each episode, it's me, Emily, XY's community manager, and otherwise known as the glue who keeps this XY ship together. I'll be breaking down each podcast episode into a nice little bite-sized chunk, easily digestible, and will give you an idea of the podcast that's about to follow. So with that said, let's get straight into it. First of all, wow. Wow is literally the only word that came to mind after listening to this podcast almost three times now. There is something in this episode for all advisors, but definitely with special mention to any insurance advisors out there who are going to be affected if the removal of insurance commissions goes ahead. If this sounds like you, Dean Mannix of Sales ITV is here to remind you of the valuable work you are doing and why he believes you should absolutely be remunerated accordingly. Dean is the undisputed expert when it comes to customer-centric sales. He's taught sales in over 28 countries and to some of the smartest people in the world. Dean and Adrian discuss how advisors can better articulate their value when it comes to insurance, why your clients should be part of your BDM team, and six key reasons why advisors don't get referrals and how to avoid them. Dean has also created two awesome courses for the XY Advisor training platform, one which focuses on his sales methodology, while the other is all about referrals, and both of them expand on everything that he talks about in this episode. If you haven't already checked them out, you can do so by heading to xyadvisor.com. We really hope you enjoy this episode, and if there's a way we can make your podcast experience even better, don't be afraid to reach out and say hello at xyadvisor.com. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $10 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leading managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. We've got Dean Mannix in today. How are you doing? Fantastic. Great to be here. Yeah, it's good to, good to have you on. We've been, Dean, for anyone that doesn't know, he's put, put a course. Is it one or two that we've got? We've out? just put two courses onto your platform, so really excited about that and the opportunity that that presents. Yeah, it's awesome. I think I think um, what Dean does is something that is really valuable for a lot of advisors. Um, I think we're going to have some fun talking about all the cool things around sales. Dean's a big proponent of sales not being a dirty word. Absolutely. And uh, I think with the Royal Commission, we've got a lot to talk about in terms of the perception that's being put out there by the media, by the commission itself, by all the stakeholders. And I think the advisors and the client acquisition process is getting left in the back seat and really sort of uh, the significance of assisting people make a good decision about um, working with a professional. Yeah. I think that's really been pushed to the side, so i going to enjoy talking a bit about that. Yeah, look, I'd say the thing that's blown me away over the last couple of weeks post-report being handed down is um, I've actually been doing quite a few conferences in the mortgage broking space, mm. and so they really got blindsided in terms of their entire model is at risk, but as a result of that, I think not enough attention has been paid to the fact that uh, life insurance and insurance as we know it is at absolute risk because of the suggestions that Hayne was making, which is, let's get commission down to zero. Now, he offered no alternative whatsoever in mm. terms of, well, then, how do we compensate the people who have to do the incredibly hard work to help people get it in place? And uh, I don't think that's getting enough airtime at the moment. Yeah, I think I think the, the complete stripping without really shaping up how uh, people are going to get inspired to actually essentially save the, the government money and the taxpayer, essentially, in the long term, because... Everyone that doesn't have any cover, they just fall on the welfare system. So the, the alternatives to actually plugging that gap, no one's really talking about actually solving the yeah, fundamental well, issue there. Welfare doesn't pay your mortgage, doesn't put your kids through school, doesn't enable them to get ahead in life, um, doesn't mean that you don't have to take on a job within two to three months of losing a loved one. So whilst the government can provide a small fallback, the reality is that most people are going to be in a much worse position if the professionals that are listening to this aren't compensated fairly for doing the hard work that it takes to help people close that gap. So is, would this would I take this as um, Dean being all for commissions and happy to keep them I'm around? I'm 100% for people getting compensated for the value they generate. And I think that the, uh, the people that are out there helping uh, 
uneducated people take risk out of their lives and protecting and providing for those people and their families uh, are completely undervalued. And it's very easy for someone... And, look, you know, Hayne is a person who's given a lot back to the society, very intelligent man, but as a result of being a judge on a judge's superannuation, has no concept whatsoever of how underinsured the average Australian is and the damage that would occur to that person and their family if an event occurred. So I think to allow somebody like that to make judgments the way that he has and just throw something out in this report is is absolutely devastating um, for not just for the advisors, for the people that they're advising, the people that need to be cared for by them. Mm, I, like a lot of people say that there's not enough proof that like the structure has actually done a lot of damage in terms of insurance commissions. Um, I guess... We talk about the mortgage side of things. What's your perspective on that? Because obviously insurance, that's the under-insurance problem and that's there's a strong argument for that. On the mortgage side, what are you, what's your perspective on that? Well, 59% of consumers have chosen a broker over a branch just down the road. And when the consumer speaks that loudly, what they're saying is, is I want somebody to protect my interests against these massive companies. And so the simple reality is is that if we listen to the consumer, the consumer is saying, I perceive this value, I'm happy with the model, and I use the model. So I'd rather listen to the consumer than some, either some back office bank people who are trying to shape media or the media who's looking for a story. Yeah, I think a lot of people look at what went on in the Royal Commission and there wasn't enough evidence really that um, pointed towards this sort of action against brokers. Well, only one broking firm got interviewed and that broken firm happens to be owned by a bank. I think that's enough said. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, if you were watching it in a movie, you'd be waiting for the conspiracy to come out in the open. But this is happening in real life, and it really is quite scary. Yeah, it's a, a lot of people are going, oh, we thought it was a bit like this, but, gee, it really seems like there's a bit too much... Um, uh, give at the top end of town in terms of what's going on. Like the, a lot of people are feeling like there wasn't enough, um, uh, no, enough of the rulings that actually applied to the corporate sphere. Well, um, you know, you know that I'm an ex-lawyer, uh, and so every no, I didn't ex- actually, yeah, yeah, okay, every ex-lawyer has an extreme opinion on everything. Um, but the bottom line is, I, I said to a bunch of brokers about three days ago, I said, the, you know, I I'm, haven't been a lawyer for 25 years. Um, there's not a, a lot that I know about the law anymore. But the one thing I do know is that there's no appeal process for a Royal Commission. So we can't go back in time. Mm. All we can do is shape the way that the regulators uh, make choices about how to implement or how to shape the recommendations into reg- regulation laws and um, behaviours inside practices. And so we just need to make sure that we're making enough noise and generating enough information that people understand what's going to be good for consumer and what's not. Mm. As an example, in the broken space, if you implemented the user pays fee, Mm -hmm. even if you normalised it by saying that the bank pays the fee, you know, you have to pay the fee to the bank or the broker, what everyone's ignoring there is that that's actually creating an exit fee. So see, if I'm not happy with the rate that CBA is giving me, to go to ANZ or another bank, I've got to pay that broker fee again so we've just re-established exit fees, which Bowen took out in 2011. So there's so many unintended consequences mm. that, unfortunately, people who aren't deep into the industry and don't understand the average consumer can't understand. And I think Hayne was under a lot of pressure to make recommendations very, very quickly. Mm. Um, and those were somewhat shaped by who he could see, couldn't see, and chose to see. Yeah, that's well summarised. The, the thing around, um, I guess, commissions is about... I guess I look at it going, people struggle um, if it's pulled out to actually articulate their value. Yep. And I think, and obviously, like, there's the consequences of that and how effective people are able to articulate their value. I I went through the process of taking commissions out of insurance and and it's it's uh, it's quite the process. You've got you to strip out and you've got to go, okay, well, how does that, how do you articulate what's going on here to the consumer? And it's the same for the broker. So I think either way, whatever the commission, the remuneration structure that comes in, I think people need help in articulating and alleviating that challenge. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's uh, insurance is a very, very, very special case in my mind because it's one of the few products in the world where there is no immediate benefit and what you're buying is you're buying cover for something you hope will never happen. And, and so every psychological bias we have 
is sets us up to not buy insurance. And and so it's it's I think it's a very unique product and I think that the people who are able to convince people to buy the right cover and I really believe insurance must be and needs to be sold the people that cause other human beings to make a decision about whether the person they're talking to is covered or uncovered are generating a very valuable service that can't actually be understood by the person buying it mm. at a really deep level until an event occurs or they see a friend who's close have an event that occurs. And so to make judgments about the value of that um, without having gone through that sort of event is wrong. And to just look at the absolute amount in isolation of the five other people they had to chat to, the amount of work they have to do, the failure rate that people have in relation to eligibility, um, it completely ignores just how much is involved in actually getting mm. helping somebody buy the right cover. Yeah, so, you, so you're saying the psychology, the impediments in place of people making those decisions, that if there's not enough, um, I guess, incentive for the outcome for the person that's presenting the opportunity, like the insurance advisor, for yes. example, that that it's not going to happen. So much of the cost of sale is hidden. Mm -hmm. So you could say, wow, that insurance advisor got paid $7,000 for that policy, but you are ignoring so many other things that advisor had to do to actually put that in place. And so much of the risk that the advisor took in taking on that person, taking them through the process, giving them advice along the way without getting paid for that, and having no payment strategy other than to get the policy put in place. Um, that's just been ignored in this debate. Well, I think, yeah. I, I, I put it to you, but in terms of, is that not just the challenge of the, the advisor or the insurance advisor in a particular case, that they need to get better at articulating what they do and actually looking at their business model? I live and breathe sales. Okay, for the last 22 years, I've done nothing but spent time thinking about and working with companies to figure out better ways to sell things. That's all I do for a living. And I would find it incredibly challenging to say to somebody who walked through my door, look, I'm going to pay, you're going to pay me $5,000 whether I get you insurance or not. Um, I can't guarantee what's going to happen because you could have a medical condition that both of you and I don't know about, but I need to get paid anyway. Uh, the bottom line is I don't believe that insurance can be sold en masse, which it needs to be because our underinsurance problem in Australia is massive. I do not believe it can be sold en masse that way and I think that forcing advisors to sell that way is actually excluding a massive amount of population that need this and it's the lowest socio-economic part of our country um, who are harmed the most when an event occurs and yet making people sell on fees up front is going to exclude those people. Yeah, it's an impediment in the sales process. It's terrible and the bottom line is those people have been hoodwinked into thinking and believing that they are insured because it's somewhere in their super but we all know that when we do the sums and we do the maths and we look at the research that there is the, the gap is massive. And and look, the bottom line is, you know, as I said, I, I lost my father young. We were significantly underinsured. Um, I'm the classic story of, of the family house having to be sold up into, and moving into a little unit with my mother, watching my mother have to go back to work. Um, and and so I'm very, very passionate about this. Yeah, I can see that. That's, uh, a lot of people out there will be, I guess, listening to this with a bit of... Uh, I guess appreciation uh, because the amount of people that um, I guess a lot of people don't understand that sort of dynamic and actually what goes on in that process. And no, and it doesn't make good media. No, the problem is it doesn't. It does not make good media. It takes a lot to explain. It's very hard to actually explain, and so. Um, I'm feeling for the advisors at the moment whose models are under attack and I think very, very unfairly. What do you think about the concept that there's, there's been proposals put forward by, I guess, more risk specialist uh, networks or advisors to segregate uh, insurance advice as a separate, um, to carve it out of the holistic sort of financial advice legislation and uh, I guess everything that applies to that. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? I agree with it because, I, as I said before, I think that the biases that cause someone to not make smart choices to protect and provide for themselves and their family are so significant and so real that to apply um, regulatory frameworks that work in other areas um, is, is not appropriate in that area and it's going to cause... We're, we're already failing. We're failing the consumer right now to create more regulation around that 
um, that ignores the special the special circumstances of that of that advice. I won't call it a sale, but it is a sale. Mm. Um, is going to cause a lot of harm to the end consumer. And this and the thing is is that you know a lot of people say, oh yeah, but you know like insurance, like you often never get paid out because you don't die. It's like yeah, but if you do, and you're not covered, covered, the, the the damage is catastrophic. And so using that as an argument, I think I, I just I, I won't cop because I've been through it myself. Absolutely. Well, so we talked about the problems. Like, yeah, let's talk about, about like positive. <laughs> yeah, I think like yeah, we can talk about how messed up everything is all day. But what what can like, what can we share in terms of uh, what what you do with people around what 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 you so an insurance advisor say the comms get cut out. Yep. What are you going to tell them? How are you going to help them? All right. So I think that. I think that every organisation where the comms get cut out or comms don't get cut out needs to be evolving and adapting um, to, in, into this market space. And the bottom line is is that every single person who owns a business um, or sells something for a living uh, really needs to be paying a lot more attention to the sales and marketing side of their business. Uh, the world's only becoming more competitive. Uh, we're moving into an age where we're competing with robots uh, and algorithms uh, we need to absolutely maximise our uh, our difference, which is the fact that we're humans and we can empathise and we can engage. And so everybody needs to be paying a lot more attention to the sales and marketing side of their advice business. Otherwise, their advice business is going to disappear. Um, there are many things that I see the best advisors doing. I always start with referrals. The bottom line is, is that I think most advisors believe that they've got referrals handled. But when you do an analysis of the 100 to 400 clients that they have and you do a spreadsheet around how many have actually referred in the last 12 months um, you see that there is a gaping gaping hole in relation to the potential that an a client base who's motivated to help knows they should help and knows how to help um, could have on on the business um, and the number of people that they could help there out, out there in the market so what are some of those techniques in terms of those, getting those referrals and closing that gap. Yeah, you... for sure. So it's, it's amazing. You know, so, so I was talking the other day about this um, six key reasons why advisors don't get referrals. Um, number one, and I like to share this story, is, is I was talking to an advisor over in um, Canada. Uh, I was actually running a session for a group of advisors in Calgary and went through the session and, and basically this fellow was literally turning grey and looking sick in the session, on the way through the session. And that went on for about an hour. And um, all the other advisors were high-fiving and getting excited. It was North America's, by the way. Um, and saying that was fantastic, that was fantastic. It's quite a bit of difference in the it's very different. style, isn't it? Yeah, obviously Canada's lower key than the US, but they're still a bit more... Um, Excitable, I guess, up there in the lacking, in the lacking that tall poppy syndrome over there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so. But I, I think we're just we're, we're so beaten up in Australia around you know don't sell, don't be motivated, don't be excited. And yet these are the things that that's the fuel that that drives Human. growth in a business. Yeah. Um, but this fellow at the end of the session, uh, short you know long, long story short, basically said, "Wow, I I've been in this industry nearly thirty years and I have not asked for a referral because." Early in my career, I asked for one and someone said, look, this is a private matter. You don't ask for referrals. And so that fellow had you know, created this barrier for himself, which had lasted nearly 30 years. And he was very upset because I, I talked him through about a dozen different strategies. And he went, all of those are totally applicable and I haven't used any. And I'm one of the bottom quartile learners, despite the fact that I'm a great advisor. I work my butt off. I care about my customers. Um, you've really upset me. Show me how easy this is. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, number one reason, bad experience. Number two, no results. So we see advisors out there who go and talk to an accountant, um, engage them, feel like they've had a great discussion. Uh, there's promises both sides in terms of referring each other, and then nothing happens. And as human beings, we don't like to do anything that doesn't yield a result. Oh, that's no fun. I'm not yeah. going to do that again. Uh, three is a fear. So we see people actually afraid uh, to to ask for a referral because they think, well, what if I get a referral from a great client but then I can't help that person? Does that make me look bad to my existing client? And I think in this chaotic and uncertain world um, where there's many things that an advisor... It could happen that are outside of an advisor's control that cause them to not be able to provide the advice or access the product. Um, there's a real, real fear of, of getting a referral that they can't help. Uh, number four is to pray out. So I think a lot of people advice, should come to me. Is that sort of well? There's a bit of that, but there's also asking for help is showing weakness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 for those advisors listening to this, I really hope this makes the tape. If there's one piece of advice I can give you, is no no business and no human ever became great without asking for help. 
And so get better at asking for help. You know, I, I see all of my clients, I call them customers, but I see all of my customers as part of my business development team and I'm unashamedly asking for help uh, because the more, more time I spend on them, the less time I have for business development. So if they want me to spend more time on them, they need to help me with business development. That's the way I think about it. Totally. Um, so, and the classic one there is people say, how's business? People go, oh, great. Or, oh, I'm so busy. Well, if you say both of those things, you're sending a subconscious message mm. to the other person that they don't need to refer and don't need to help. True. So even just saying things are great, but there's always room for another great client. How are you going? Right? So it's... Yeah, it's, it's, you're, t- you're touching on some really good things there. Like one thing is one of the, some of the best advisors I've seen were like they do, I've seen them ask for so much help over the years. And it's just made them into such good businesses over time because they have sourced and sourced the support of other people. Absolutely. And look, only the strong can help the weak. The bottom line is the stronger your advice business is and the more confident you are as you walk into work each and every day that basically growth is taken care of, the better positioned you are to really do the right thing by your clients, really deliver the right service, really spend your time on the stuff that's going to be valuable for them. Whereas if you're sitting there desperate, finding it hard to pay the bill, just making budget or maybe below the budgets... Um, you're not in a position to provide fantastic advice. And you're you, probably, you know... We've just talked on pretty much what XY Advice is all about, which is essentially bringing advisors together to achieve that sort of outcome by sharing what they're doing. So yeah. it's, um, guys, you're doing a good job out there. <laughs> Thanks for everyone that contributes. The other thing you're talking about is confidence. And I, I like, the more I've been sort of talking to people and the more you sort of see the Royal Commission play out, this stuff, it's not about... It's not about necessarily solving the functional things that you're going to do to solve the problems or how you're going to change what you're doing. You could be, you could have the best way of doing things, but if you're not confident in what you're doing. So an example being some of the best advisors out there now, because of the uncertain compliance regime, they're getting completely unsettled in the way that they do what they do. Absolutely. And you would, most people would walk in, they'd have no doubt that this person's going to give value to their clients. But they're seeing an environment where they don't know if they're doing the right thing. And I've got no doubt. I, I knew what it was like when I was advising, how it affected me when you're wondering, yep. are you ticking the right boxes? Did you do the right thing? Because of the moving goalposts all the time. So how do people how do people regain that confidence? And is it... Because how, how would you suggest that people... Yeah, for sure. So, that? so the, the, the bottom line is, is that an uncertain person is an unproductive person. And so another word for confidence is just certainty. Mm. And and what advisors need to be thinking about is, are they focusing on things that are going to create uncertainty? As an example, are the recommendations going to be implemented into law? None of us really know, and none of us are really going to know for three to six to maybe 12 to 18 months. So the more energy and time you spend on pontificating and hypothesizing and coming up with different variations and worrying about that and wondering about that and thinking about that, the more uncertain you're going to become and the less productive and efficient and effective you're going to become, which harms your clients. So you've got to become an expert at looking for areas and creating areas in which you can find certainty. So a couple of obvious things are, one, routine. The more you use routine in your life, as in I call clients from 9 till 10, I read the paper from 4 to 5 p.m. because I know it's going to upset me, so I'll put that at the end of the day. <laughs> um, I... I I speak to three people that gave me a great NPS score at least once a week. The more you can deliberately do things that make you feel certain about the outcome and your business and the future, the more confident you're going to become. Mm. So routine is very, very, very powerful and it should underpin everything in terms of creating certainty. I think the second thing is focus, just making sure that you're focusing on the things that make you certain and not focusing on the things that make you uncertain, like reading the newspaper, complaining and whinging and whining to your mate over a beer. Look, I'm not saying you can't do that, but pick the times to do that and limit... Only between 6 and 7 p.m. Yeah, limit the amount of time you're going to be spending doing that. I think the third thing is priming your brain. So what are you doing first thing in the morning? Now, there's many different things you can do in the morning to build confidence. You could listen to a song that inspires you. You could go for a walk and just pay attention to the things you really like. You could spend three minutes um, meditating or just being quiet and asking yourself, what am I grateful for? Uh, there are, you could walk downstairs and make the kids lunch and just and, and meditate on what do I love about my kids, what do I love about my kids, what do I love about my kids. There are so many things that if you just put your mind to it that you can do first thing in the morning that set you up for a much better day. But I'm finding most advisors are losing the morning mm. because the first thing they do is look at markets, 
which most advisors shouldn't be because they've got a long-term strategy. The next thing they do is look at the news and read about all the things they're upset about. The next thing they do is listen to the shock jock on the radio uh, and they set themselves up for failure every single day. What are some of the, some of the things that you do? Um, so I'm really big on exercise in the morning. Yep. Uh, I'm big on practicing gratitude. Yep. Um, so uh, I was, I, I, I'm sure I would have been diagnosed as having ADHD um, as a young child, but my father's response to that at the age of 12 and a half was we're going to go down to the meditation center and we're going to teach you meditation, wow. which I'm 50 years old now. So 37 and a half years ago, that was very hippie kind of stuff back then. And my father was definitely not a hippie. Well, everyone's listening. He doesn't look 50. So um, there's something in this meditation. So, uh, <laughs> so, so they're, they're probably some of the big things for me. I'm very, very deliberate about what I avoid. So, um, Unless I'm in the Qantas lounge, and I must admit I'm guilty if I'm in the Qantas lounge, I'll grab, uh, I'll grab the Fin Review and have a read of it. But I'm very deliberate about not buying the newspaper. I don't listen to the radio. Um, and I avoid stimulus that I know is likely to send me over the edge and frustrate me. Mm. Yeah, that's some great tips there. And I, I do hear there's a bit of yoga that you've um, dabbled yeah. in the past. <laughs> yeah, I, I tend to uh, get a bit excited about things when I do them. So I'm a qualified yoga teacher. I haven't taught for quite a while. Okay. Um, what type of yoga is it? Vinyasa? Or is it? Oh, it's a mixture of hatha and ayanga. But I think anybody who's genuinely into yoga... Um, yoga's 3,000 years old. There's a bunch of people who branded it up and made it cool or uncool or we do this type or we do that type. But to me, yoga's just yoga. It's just the practice of of finding focus, becoming aware and in some shape, manner or form, using your body to uh, to alleviate stress and improve health. Yeah, if anyone um, that hasn't tried it out there, I'd, I'd try to do it at least once a week because it's just like I don't know anything that reaches the parts of your body that you never move than yoga. Like you... Like, you could go all sorts of gym exercises, totally. but if you go into yoga, you're going to hit a lot of different areas that you never, like, your body never moves. And there's, there's yoga for everybody, right? There's a type of yoga for everyone. So if you're sitting out there going, yeah, but I can't put my leg behind my head, neither can I, guys. Um, it was actually a, a big ego thing for me as an instructor. So many of my, uh, you know, students were way more flexible than I was, mm. and I had to get over that. But... Um, definitely it's it's very powerful to, to force you to stop and reflect and come into the moment uh, and if you're not physically fit I think it's fantastic because generally you have to work a little harder and that actually brings people right into the moment because they have to work and they forget about the rest of the world yeah absolutely um, but on that point it's a really good one I was in a conference um, uh, a different conference a couple of days ago and one of the fellows brought it up and I thought it was really cool was that hey, a lot of you right now, because of all this uncertainty, are probably experiencing a lot of anxiety and stress and strain. And he said, and if you are, please give someone, and you're all welcome to call me, a call and just vent it, get it out of your system. So um, for all those advisors out there that are listening to this that maybe are feeling more anxiety, more stress, more concern, more worry, and don't feel like there's someone to share it with, you know, find someone to share it with or... Or call a professional service and just download because you, you don't want to be carrying this stuff around internally because it's going to harm you, it's going to harm those you care about, and it's going to hurt your ability to help your clients. Mm, I, just a couple of days ago, I was, I was sort of flipping out of it, you might say. <laughs> I was feeling a bit overwhelmed with everything, and I was, went to my business partner who just started, uh, essentially starts with a bit of a whinge, but you start to talk about the problems and all of it. Then you look about the next day, I'm like, oh, I was just a bit overloaded. Maybe I was just... Totally. But the release that happens through that process is just so, um, like, you look at it in hindsight. Sometimes the impediment to... Sorry, the um, the start of actually talking is not... The driver of that isn't about no. the outcome. It's about you feeling just frustrated. get it out. I mean, what's mm. the best way to get a tree to grow? You prune it. What's the best way to grow as a human being? Release that crap and then move on. And so um, I think it's really important because if we think about the... the st- the demographic of the average advice uh, advisor, um, they're kind of my age and they're grumpy and they're overly proud and <laughs> and they don't, you know, they don't really want to share that sort of stuff. Guys, get it out of, guys and girls, I should say, get it out of your system. Mm. Um, I think the reason that, that most females age and grow so much better than most of us blokes is because they're really good at this stuff. Mm. And that's, I know that's a little bit of a generalisation, but... Ah, <laughs> see what you see. <laughs> So, so Dean, what have you been doing? Like, you've been running this business for a while. What, what sort of led you to where you are now? If you look back at sort of what are some of the key stages in your career, so to speak? You said you started as a lawyer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So uh, I was never going to be a lawyer long term. Um, I was really good at it. I was an angry little man. I was a litigator. <laughs> um, but I was a little bit too good at destroying things. Okay. And that kind of freaked me out. Uh, and um, so, so long story short, um, got out of law, got into a development company, bought them out, was uber successful as a young person. Uh, I was 25 and a half, had 137 staff. I was brilliant, just ask me. Uh, and then blew it all up by the time I was 26 and a half. Um, was massively in debt, have no family money or no family ties to money. And a mate of mine said, you should sell photocopiers. <laughs> As you do. And I said, you don't know how much money I owe. He said, you don't know how much money you can earn. And so <laughs> I got into photocopier sales. And I know it sounds crazy, but sales literally... Was that with commission? Yeah, it was 100% commission, actually. That, that must have been very the ethical then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so sales... Um, Sales was something that found me. I think it was always going to find me and got me out of a lot of financial trouble and, and gave me an amazing quality of life. Uh, and then as part of my charity in terms of donating money to things, I used to run, I used to write a newsletter back in the 90s. Um, I used to go out to 900 odd people and we used to have to print them and fold them and put them in envelopes and lick the stamps and send them out. And I'd run a, um, a, a workshop once a month for the newsletter group uh, and get speakers in. And once in a while a speaker wouldn't turn up and I became the speaker. Okay. And so about three times of that happened, and someone said, "Hey, can you please uh, can you can you speak to our company?" I went, "Oh, well, if you pay me, I'll do it." So I became a motivational speaker by mistake, and then had a successful sales business. And someone said, "Hey, can you train us how to do sales?" And I said, "Oh, I reckon I can." And uh, that's how I got into it. And uh, I've been incredibly blessed, you know. So I've been doing and focusing on and researching. Uh, something that I love and I've, I've worked in over 28 countries over the last 20 years with many of the smartest people in the world and I mean that literally people hired by Goldman Sachs, UBS, um, Bain and Company, McKinsey, a Boston Consulting Group uh, and taught the smart people how to sell and challenged, challenged them and mm-hmm. argued with them so yeah I feel incredibly blessed. Yeah, nice. And I, Em was Em sort of asked a few questions on the on the way into our um, guests, and she did mention something about um, the GFC and you contributing to it. Something. Yeah, yeah. I always tell the story that basically uh, through uh, four, five, six, seven, I was roaming around the world with all these huge companies, and and one of my primary um, target markets was um, selling alternative asset based products. So does that include uh, mortgage securities in the uh, US? Pretty much included everything, <laughs> and uh, and my one saving grace is I was I was left holding many of those dodgy products. Okay, um, you put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, exactly. When when things blew up, uh, and and it's quite fascinating for me in hindsight. The simple reality is most of the people selling those products, um, who were very very smart people, including myself really didn't understand the structuring ramifications of those products and and whilst they were fantastic products in bull markets they were absolutely horrific when things went bad but uh, I always felt a little bit bad at the fact that I just roamed around the world training all these people to sell these things en masse and my one saving grace was that I'd bought a lot of the products so I did believe in it. Yeah so well yeah so Dean caused the financial crisis. (laughs) Well, what do you what do you think about? Do you get into the markets these days? Do you really pay much attention to it, or is no? It- I, I look. I couldn't tell you what the Dow had done um, for the last year with any great level of certainty. Uh, when I was very focused on selling to people who worked in markets and were impacted day to day, I was very, very, very aware of it. Um, but I'm a huge believer in the value of compounding. I'm a huge believer in avoiding your biases. Uh, I'm a huge believer in not looking at your super on a regular basis. A uh, huge believer in just putting in place a strategy that you believe in and reviewing it maybe once a year and even then um, reviewing it lightly and changing heavily in terms of, uh, you know, really think carefully before you change a long-term strategy. Yeah, nice. Oh, a lot of advisors are going. Good advice for the average. Yeah, I'm kind of the ideal client. I never blame <laughs> the advisor and I've got a long-term view and I don't... I always say to advisors, you know, the, the one expectation you've got to set with every single client is... Uh, I will not discuss volatility with you. Yeah, totally. So if you ring me because BHP moved 5% overnight, that's a volatility discussion. Let's have it over a beer and you can complain all you want, but I'm not going to discuss that in the context of strategy. Yeah, a lot of people say it's, it's more about the expectation setting, really, that sets these things up. Absolutely. I mean, and I think that, that comes back to that value conversation, right? You, you've got to set the expectations and say, 
my value in terms of our long-term investment strategy is actually just keeping you sane on the way through. Uh, my value in terms of putting together a structure and a strategy for you won't be realised until you go to sell and you avoid the tax consequences that you would have been uh, exposed to if we didn't have the right structure in place. My value in terms of covering the risk in your family with insurance and personal insurance, I hope it never gets realised. Um, and so I think that explaining the value that you deliver in terms of um, what you're going to help someone avoid and setting their expectations around when they cash in on that value is a really important part of the value advisor, uh, sorry, the advisor's value proposition that many of them just don't do an effective job explaining. So with, with the engagement process with advisors, what are some of the things you see that I guess often like have a big impact when you tweak or work with an advisor? What, what have you seen um, make huge, obviously you've said referrals before, but I guess if we go back to the commission discussion and the articulation of value, to me, like obviously you can talk about everything that's going on, but the core thing that people can focus on that is going to help whether it's commissions or not commissions is how you articulate the value of what you're doing. What are, what are some of the things or the sure. barriers that you see people pushing through? Look, there's, there's seven things that grow that, that drive growth in, from a sales perspective in any business. Um, and, and telling a compelling story is, is at the centre of that and that it is very important. But what, arguably, do you, what do you mean by a compelling story? Well, a compelling story, a compelling story is one that, that, that makes you irresistible to your target market and causes people to ask, tell me more about that or can you help me with that? And so it's a story that compels action on the other side. Um, and most, most advisors, in fact, most people selling anything fall over on that. They, 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 they don't understand the fundamentals behind how to tell a compelling story. They don't understand the psychology behind how to tell a compelling story. They do their value proposition workshop, which comes up with some BS bingo words that they'd never say out loud to another human being, and they stop there. And, and, and it's a shame because there is a very compelling story that underlines or under, you know, underpins the value and advice that should be, be told. Would you say it's a... I don't know, I'm thinking, what I'm thinking here is like a gap in authenticity. Is that, is that what you're talking about? No, I don't think it's an authenticity thing, actually. I think it's more about not understanding two things. One... What does what I do look like, sound like, and feel like from a, a client's point of view? Mm-hmm. And I think the other thing is um, being very benefit-focused versus risk-focused, as in people respond to and act on the downside far more than the upside. And that's Kahneman and Tversky. They won a Nobel Prize for it, um, you know, proving that the economic reasonable man didn't exist. Uh, and so they tell the story from the wrong side of things. Uh, so I don't, think it's, I don't think it's so much about authenticity, but where authenticity comes into play is when you try to do a sales job mm. and you don't feel confident about what you're saying, your authenticity suffers dramatically. Mm. Um, so well, the, I interrupted some of the points yeah. there. So. Oh, no, that's okay. So the compelling story is critical, but just as critical is that you're telling it to the right person slash sharing it with the right person. You see, I think a lot of advisors target the wrong person. They target the person they think they can earn the most money out of as opposed to they target the person that they can help the most. Mm. And there's a big distinction there. And so um, if, you want to, if you want to target ultra-rich, 200 million-plus uh, net wealth uh, families, that's fantastic, but you better have an incredible set of skills to help those people, and you better be in the top probably 0.2% of advisors in Australia. Well, there's not too many people that have that much wealth. <laughs> that, correct, and there's not, but there's not that many advisors that have the skills. Mm. Um, so you've got to make sure that your skill set matches the people you're targeting because you'll have much more success if you target the people that you can really help mm. than if you target the people you think you can earn the most money out of or, in fact, make the most money out of is what most people say. Um, so targeting is absolutely critical, and I think that a lot of advisors do too much work, or sorry, either don't target, as in they just have a crack at anybody, or when they target, they think too much about who can I make the most money out of as opposed to who am I already very successful at helping Mm. and how can I replicate that process and make that process more efficient. Mm. What goes with that then is, okay, if I've figured out a great target market and I've figured out a great story to tell tell those people, then how do I engage them? Like, how do I make sure I'm talking to enough new people and how do I set myself up to be feel co- to feel confident engaging people in that target group? Mm. Um, so if you get those three, three things going really well, then often the rest takes care of itself. With the target, I, like, 
personally, I've seen that the targeting bit is probably one of the biggest impediments on that process. Yeah. Because I know what it was like. You're sort of sitting there going, well, like I can help everyone. Like, and you just don't, you don't want to sort of limit yourself to, I guess you're looking at your business and going, well, if someone wants to work with me, then I'll work with them sort of thing. This is what I do. What are some of the, what's a way that, or a methodology that you would suggest advisors go sure. about? Because it's just, I, even though, like I heard it said so many times and I still struggled. I was like, I think I like those people. I want to work with those people. But then I still would end up doing work yeah. for people that weren't in that group. It's, it's not about excluding everybody. Mm. It's more about saying, I am going to choose one type of customer to become absolutely excellent at helping and engaging in a conversation around the value that I can deliver to that customer and leveraging the fact that I'm helping many other customers just like them mm-hmm. and leveraging those customers to introduce me to other people just like them. So it's more about choosing to become excellent at something and good at all the rest of the stuff mm. and being honest with yourself that you can't become excellent at everything. It just yeah. doesn't happen. Well, I think there's a saying that I've heard a couple of times, which is your target's not your market. And that's... I, to my understanding of that is it refers to the, I guess, the reverberations that happen after niching and focusing on, because you're acknowledged as a professional, sorry, a specialist in that area, you're then having people gravitate towards you because you've set that um, expectation. Absolutely. And with that process, you're not necessarily just getting those people, you're getting other people from outside of that group starting to gravitate in. Absolutely. And look, advisors have to recognize they're in, they're in a business, Right. What's one of the most powerful trends in business at the moment? It's niching. The bottom line is is that is that online, you know, online targeted marketing, um, engagement through social, is creating a, a universe in which fundamentally n- there's going to be niche after niche after niche after niche, and somebody with a specific set of needs is going to go be very easy for them to find an advisor who can support that niche and so failing to choose a niche is actually ignoring the trend and setting yourself up for a lot of hard work that doesn't need to be done hmm but it's I guess standing out from the crowd I guess like. absolutely look I mean I, I you know it's fascinating for me as a consultant um, I focused on basically equity derivatives and on working with institutional equities clients um, in the early 2000s because that was running hot and I could turn up to conference after conference after conference and it took very little energy because I knew my presentation, I knew my content, it was really easy. It was when I accepted the gig with, say, the Boston Consulting Group, Mm. that would take me literally two weeks' worth of conference energy to present for two or three hours. When the other ones, I could walk straight in and go one after the other after the other. Now, my intellectual curiosity, um, you know, makes me dumb and, and gets me excited about those, you know, those fringe crazy stuff, and they were fun and they were exciting, but I've got to tell you, you know, if right now you feel like there's a bit of wear and tear on you physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. Um, you're time poor. You're not generating the revenue you want out of your business and you're not consistently doing the stuff that you love. Then targeting and focusing on one specific area is, is often the key to the path to improvement. Some great, great wise words there, Dean. Now, Dean, you've got to cut up a couple of courses out there, oh, one, on, one on there and one on its way. So everyone, anyone listening out there, go check them out on the xyadvisor.com. What else can you share about what you do and if people want to reach out to you, what would you like to Sure. So, so, so there's the stuff on the advi- xyadvisor.com I'm really excited about. There's one which is just basically around what is good process in sales. And I think that any advice team where there's a number of people really should, whether it's mine or somebody else's, should have a language around sales and should have a language around marketing that they can all use to have intelligent conversations. So there's a, a quite a low-cost process-based um, program there, and then there's one on generating referrals, and it's really powerful content. Um, you access that, you're definitely going to and apply it. You're going to accelerate through the growth curve very, very fast. In terms of other content, um, I'm very excited about the content around um, life insurance sales. So um, I'm not sure if it's up. We haven't put that up on XY Advisor yet, but basically, um, I produced a book which is an international bestseller around how to sell life insurance specifically. Okay. And there's an online program that supports that. Um, so very, very excited about that content. And, uh, content. and I'm also really excited about some stuff that we've released, which is around sales confidence, um, personal goal setting, uh, and we've actually got CPD points um, uh, for advisors on that content. So it's exciting because that's content that's 
powerful for your business, but also powerful for you personally. Um, and we've got CPD points for it, so I'm extremely excited about that stuff. Yeah, nice. And I, I think there's a book there as well. That's yeah, so there's the book. So there's the Protect and Provide book. Now, you can actually access the Protect and Provide book at deanmannix.com. Um, you can get a free copy if you just pay the postage. So in Australia, I think that's going to cost you about $12. So you basically just jump online, uh, go to the website and uh, look under the books tab. Uh, and it's a fantastic book. Just ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Dean, mate, it's been great having you on. I appreciate it. It's an honour. And look, to all the advisors out there, keep doing the great things you do. You do make a difference. And uh, no matter what you read in the media, you're very, very important. And you are generating significant value. Thanks, mate. Great stuff. <laughs>